started. Uh, a couple of you guys would catch those doors over here. I appreciate it. All right. Got a great looking crowd this morning. Are you guys all visitors? Is your first time here? You kind of have that look on your face. Too much coffee. Testing one, two. waiting on us. All right. It's good to see everybody this morning. It's great to be with uh, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, isn't it? Amen. 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 Joe Avila is going to be here this morning uh, teaching, and um, I just want to open this up in prayer. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name at ev which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of the Heavenly Father. And we give you thanks and praise for that. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who's here this morning to lead, to guide, to comfort, to teach. Father, give us ears to hear and the will to apply what we hear from your holy, eternal word. Father, if there be anyone sick here this morning, I pray that by the grace of God that you heal them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, that they may worship and praise you all the days of their life for what you've done. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity, the country that we live in, to gather, to worship openly, and praise you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Amen. 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 Good morning, y'all. Good morning. I um, overslept by two hours this morning. <laughs> this air is not very good, and I sleep on that side, so. And I set two alarms that go real bad, very loud, and I still didn't hear. But um, I had Joyce put this up. These are uh, my two favorite verses that I found in, uh, in the book of Esther. I, uh, I, I did too much, again, too much digging, too many rabbit holes this time. It was more than one. And uh, so I don't have a real good opening, and I don't have a real good closing. So in between, there's a book. <laughs> and I'm going to leave it up to the Lord to take care of that. <laughs> if I perish, I perish. <laughs> so um, in looking through uh, this book that um, I think I sent Mike a, a link to, a, um, to some guy who, uh, who was a biblical scholar, and he called me up one time, and I asked him never to do that again. Uh, this biblical scholar, who definitely is not a born-again Christian, said that the book of Esther wasn't needed in there, that it was a joke, that it was something for the theater, etc. And uh, so, I, you know, that's, that's what I thought. That was, what, five, six weeks ago? And uh, so when you, when you read the book, you, I, I, I accept the Word of God, I believe it. Some, some things are very hard to understand, right, Chuck? And, uh, but, uh, but it's God's word, and we can, uh, I, I can go saying, but what if, or yeah, but, you know, you just, that's the word of God. And so what happened is, uh, the more I got into it, the more names that popped up around, all around the book, because then I found out that between chapters one and two, or right around the beginning of chapter one of the book of Esther, which doesn't take up a real long time, like other books go for you know, you just take uh, Genesis, for instance, you know, almost 2,000 years. This book, it, uh, it's only uh, anywhere, depending on who you, who you read, it's uh, anywhere from 11, 10, 11 years to about maybe 20, 21 years. So it's not a, the book covers just a small span, you know, of this 
trip that we're going through the Bible is just a short time. And uh, one of the things that's evident to everybody, and it's printed all over the, uh, the, the Bible studies that I come across, is that the, uh, the Word of God is never mentioned. So I'm going to open with what I found here from one of the... Uh, one of the teachers that I had, he wrote this. First off, the ruler who is featured in the book is mentioned 175 times, and God is never mentioned. We're talking about it, Xerxes. Xerxes. <laughs> and uh, that's the Greek name for Ahasuerus. That's another name that's hard to find. So, um, and yet, to any reader of the book, born-again Christian, I would say, it reads with... It reads with the understanding that God is the main character, you know, in this book. God is putting himself on display in amazing ways. This book is, uh, this is a book that's quite unique, partly because it straddles one of the great moments in military history, the Battle of Thermopylae. It occurred when a Greek force of approximately 7,000 men held off more than 150,000 fighting soldiers of the Persian army, and they did it in a small 20-yard wide, 60 feet uh, pass that was along the seashore. And, uh, and what happened here, the, uh, uh, they did, uh, again, and you might know, that if you read, you might know it says that King Leonidas led the defense the defending Greeks, and when he realized he was actually surrounded, he sent away uh, the bulk of his troops back to Athens, probably, and he left behind 700 Spartans and about 1,100 other uh, non-essentials. Non um, they're called thespians and Thebes. I looked up thespians, and those are actors and things like that in our language today, but in those days, they might have been just Gophers, I don't know, and, and the thieves, I don't know what they were doing there either, but he left them behind also. So there was another 1,100. So you're talking about not a lot of people there. And these were not soldiers that he left. These 1,100 were not, they weren't trained for war, but, um, you know, and did it, and like I said, it did it in a small little space, and that's why they were able to, to defend that position because. There was a million, 150,000 people trying to get through a, you know, something the breadth or the width of a football field. And it was easy to, you know, pick him off, so to speak. So that um, what happened here then is, of course, all of them fought to their death. And, um, and from that, from that story, from that part, that time of the Bible, um, Hollywood made the movie The 300. Some of you might have seen the movie, The 300. No? Good for you. <laughs> it is fraught with um, what is referred to as uh, um, dramatic freedom. In other words, we don't think this happened, but we'll put this in here. And we don't know. That's not good. We'll put that in there. So, I mean, the, uh, some other soldiers are regaled. Uh, I saw some little snippets of it to find out what I was talking about. But, um, you know, that, that movie was, like I said, I, a lot of people watched it, and they didn't know what it was about. Just 300 people against a whole bunch of other people. Uh, now, that stands right around the opening of the book of Esther. <coughs> Esther is a response, so to speak, to a black eye gotten by Xerxes. Xerxes now is the son of Darius, the previous king, who was there a previous battle. And... Uh, he was there to accomplish a certain, you know, to take over all of Greece. Uh, Darius had sent letters of surrender to all the nations around the, the Mediterranean and Europe, and all of them accepted the surrender except for Athens, except for Greece and Sparta. And, of course, uh, Darius couldn't have that. Besides, uh, Athens and uh, the Athenians and Sparta had helped out another country, the Ionians or something like that, that he was, he was not too happy with some of these islands. And so he was going to go in with all these men just to take care of these two little countries. And he, uh, he was successful, let's say 80% successful. Um, 
and he, but uh, he was not able to, I, I have here, he was not able to follow up on his plans to overpower the Greeks. So one of the, one of the greatest moments in history is sitting right on top of, of what it might, that might, I thought it required a closer look. And uh, because the book opens uh, with Xerxes in power, you know, and it, when, uh, when the king is throwing this 180 day party and, uh, and after the 180-day party, then he throws another seven-day party for all the helpers that were helping out in the uh, 180 days. And he did this to show off his riches and all the, I mean, uh, go, in and, go in and read the description of, of the grounds and of all the holdings that, that the prince had. Uh, it, I just don't have time to go through it. I'm afraid to run out of time and not even get to the non-ending. Uh, so King Darius, the father of Xerxes, that was uh, during the first Persian invasion of Greece during the Greco-Persian Wars, began in 492 BC, which is only about six or eight years before Xerxes comes into power. <clears throat> and it ended, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it ended with a decisive Athenian victory at the Battle of Marathon. Now we're familiar with the Marathon today, uh, and, and that was in 490 BC. Now, Esther takes place in 486 B.C., according to the writings, and it goes right through 465 B.C., which is 21 years. So, so this is a, um, a, a, a few-year period of the story of Esther taking shape right here. The invasion, consisting of two distinct campaigns, was ordered by the Persian king Darius, um, primarily in order to punish the city-states, as I said, of Athens and Eritrea. Eritrea, is that right? Eritrea, uh, and these, these cities had supported um, the, the cities of Ionia uh, during their, their revolt against the Persian rule, which, this, like I said, this is just a battle that happened before, and uh, Darius wanted to extend his empire totally all the way to the, all the, way to the Atlantic, you know, so he, uh, he couldn't have a couple of little countries here, you know, not, not, not giving in to his demands. So the first campaign uh, in 492 was led by, uh, and then it goes on who the leaders were, Madanius, uh, resubjugated Thrace, and, and a few others, and just goes on and on with all these names that I, wanted, I started to look into, and, and the story just got into about a three-hour period. So, uh, and I, I'm going to post some of my paperwork on our channel in case you want to read it. It's very interesting, and it, it's by, uh, by topic. But anyhow, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the, the Greek army eventually wound up just beating them up so bad out in, the, uh, out in the sea, you know, with their smaller ships that were very maneuverable versus the bigger ships of the uh, Persian army. And um, so, um, so he re as I said before, the second Persian campaign was in 90, was under the command of another bunch of uh, generals. Uh, the expedition headed first to the islands of Naxos, which it captured and burned. It then hopped between the rest of the Cycladic islands, or Cycladic islands, annexing each to the Persian Empire. Now, reaching Greece, the expedition landed back at this country of Eritrea, which it besieged, and after a brief time captured it, and it was razed and burned, and its citizens were enslaved. Finally, the task force headed to Attica, landing at Marathon. This is what I was talking about. And there it was met by a smaller Athenian army, which nevertheless proceeded to win a remarkable victory at the Battle of Marathon. And that's when this, and I can't even pronounce this guy's name, <laughs> Philippidides or something like that. He, he, was, he was a runner. He had, he had been running to different parts, taking messages. He was like the Pony Express uh, of our times, not today. Um, and so by the time he got to, um, to Athens and he, and his last words is, we won, or we win, and he collapsed and he died. Um, and so this defeat prevented the successful conclusion of the campaign and the task force returned to Asia. Nevertheless, the expedition had fulfilled most of its, most of its aims, punishing all the little islands and bringing much of the Aegean under Persian rule, as well as the full inclusion of Mac Macedon. You know, um, that's Macedonia today. There was a young man there at the time by the name of Philip. We know that that city, though, back in the, the Roman times, is Philippi. 
Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. And as you know, a few hundred, about a hundred years later, when Philip died and his young son took over, then Alexander the Great, again, it was all about revenge and, and taking over power, just like today. And so um, at the, uh, the, uh, the unfinished business from its campaign led Darius to prepare for a much larger invasion of Greece, to firmly subjugate it and to punish Athens and Sparta. However, internal strife within the empire delayed the, this expedition, and Darius then died of old age. It was thus left to his son, Xerxes I, to lead the second Persian invasion of Greece. And that was beginning in 480 BC. So this is right during the, uh, the, right, uh, during the time of, uh, of Esther. Now, Esther doesn't appear in the book until chapter 2. Um, the, uh, the other fellow, Haman, comes in, I think, in chapter 3 and so forth. And this is several years ago and by. Not too many like in other books of the Bible. But, um, so, uh, so the book of uh, Esther opens up in chapter 1, verse 1. And if you can open your Bibles to uh, Athens, uh, Athens, how about Esther, chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read some of it just, just to to say we did a Bible study today. <clears throat> uh, you're all there, I hope. Number one, verse one, now in the days of Ahasuerus, oh, by the way, uh, the name Ahasuerus was the uh, Persian name, and Xerxes is the name used by the Greeks. So the Bible, there's only two versions of the Bibles that, that have the name uh, Xerxes in it, and I think the NIV is one, and I don't remember the other one. But uh, what we'll be reading and seeing in your Bibles, unless you have an NIV, you'll be seeing Ahasuerus as the king who reigned from India. <laughs> you, so you have India, Pakistan now. There wasn't a, India, Pakistan, and, and uh, where is it? Uh, Ethiopia. No, 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 that's way later. No, coming from the east to the west. Oh, Afghanistan, and then Iran, and now today's Iraq. And then you get into Jordan and, and Syria and Turkey and south towards Israel. Then we get down into Egypt and Ethiopia. Yeah. 127 principalities, so to speak, is what he covered. That's what hit, that was his. And he gotten, again, they were looking to go west, you know, through the Mediterranean and all, and probably to the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was everybody's, um, everybody's goal. All, all the... Uh, what's his name, uh, Alexander the Great, <clears throat> went, <clears throat> went all the way from uh, Spain and all the way to India as well, and some say into China. But <clears throat> so what uh, Esther Harris does, he's living at, uh, he's got his royal throne in Susa, or Shushan, uh, as the capital, and he had four, four castles, okay, and this was the, uh, the, the southern castle, or the the plushest, I guess, and so that's where he made his home. Uh, and so in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants, the armies of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the princes, and they were all before him. Well, he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his great greatness for many days, 180 days. Now, these, uh, what I'm reading here is from the ESV. Uh, I was going to use the King James, but I think I'll let um, my friend over there read it next week. You've got that beautiful King James that I love. But for today, I'm using the, <clears throat> the ESV. So it says here, and then, and when these days were completed, the king gave for all of the people present in Susa, the citadel, both great and small, that's the, the, uh, all the helpers, the poor, everybody, uh, he gave them a feast lasting seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. Now, he goes on to describe, the writer goes on to describe the, uh, the setting. There were white cotton curtains and violet, and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of, what was it, porphyry, marble, mother of pearl and precious stones. 
Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of a different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to, according to the bounty of the king. I'm thinking that was good wine. <clears throat> and drinking was according to, the, to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all of the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Party time. Queen, Vash, uh, Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to the king. So on the seventh day, on the last day of the seven-day party, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of the king to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she, was a love, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, at this the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment. It's another way of saying that the king didn't know anything. The law, uh, he always went to his advisors. We have that today in our government. <laughs> Just saying, I'm not judging. <laughs> The, uh, the men next to him were, and then there's seven names that I can't pronounce, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. In other words, they were right first, they were right, right around him. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Azarus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Memukan, one of them, said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all of the provinces of King Hasaharis. For the queen's behavior, behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all of the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath aplenty. If it please the king, now this is the, um, the advisor still speaking, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before the king as a Harris, and let the king give her a royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all, all, all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. Um, this decree was, again, here comes the Pony Express. The decree is put together really quick, signed by the king, or this ring is... Uh, pressed on the wax and, and, and different languages to all the different countries, different provinces, different riders in different directions with fresh horses. And they had like the Pony Express, they had stops along the way where they would just get a fresh horse or two and then just keep going. So within days, he knew that everybody in the uh, kingdom would, um, would know. Uh, so this advice pleased the king, the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in his own script, and their own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his household and speak according to the language of his people. That's the end of, um, that's the, end of uh, the first chapter. Um, I'd like to do ten, all ten. We don't have time. And there's other things I wanted to do here. So I have one of those short videos that may, we're having trouble here. No. Can, can you put the, okay. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Uh, this video is Esther, and it's about nine and a half minutes long. And it'll tell you more than I can tell you in, in 10 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll pick up and see what I have left here. You know, he's, I don't hear the sound, though. Well, you have a sound button here. I do. Huh? I told you we're having trouble. No, 
I don't know. Why don't we have sound? Oh, look at the thing to see if it's on, on uh, mute. Nope. How do you know it's not? Oh, there. Yeah. Hit the oh. hit the. Uh, Check the, the, the microphone. No, it's all the way up. Okay. Cancel video. <laughs> the best laid plans. And it doesn't do uh, good to try to read everything that pops up on the screen. It keeps moving. But anyway, what I'll do, I'll send you the link. On, on those of you that are uh, registered on, the, uh, on my email weekly list, and those of you that are not, uh, I have blanks. If you want to sign up to, uh, for the, I will mail you the link not only to today's teaching, but it includes the whole, the whole channel. I, I forgot to put these up again. I'm two hours late right now, so I put these up on, on your tables normally. Come up and get, get one. Just fill it out. All I need is your name and your email address. And sometime by Monday afternoon, I try to get to get uh, done earlier, but... By Monday afternoon, you'll have the video on, on today's teaching, and then you also have, I'm trying to add a little more. I don't want to overburden you. I was going to give you homework, but <laughs> <laughs> I do that, right, Mike? I give homework to my Tuesday night guys. I think before I go on, uh, Chuck had a comment. Uh, all of this land under the control of the king, is that where all of the Jewish people live? No. No? No. No. Oh, I thought if they all lived in his territory, it would be very easy for them to eliminate the Jews. They were all exiled to Babylon, but the Persians and the Medes, years before, which I was going to do, uh, beat the, uh, the Babylonians. They went downhill with their, again, their government, and they were taken over. So, so what the Persian Empire included, I just said, what yeah. is today... Babylon. Yeah. And well, he was control over a big area. Yeah. Let, I'll, get, I'll get to the Jews and where they're at and why they're there. Okay. This is a long teaching. Okay. It's going to be longer because I don't have that thing to take up 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to squeeze out my writing here. But anyway, uh, some, I lost my page. So uh, after the movie, I go into what's in a name. Again, I more than once I've told you that I have this question marks in my head and a few ping pong games going on at the same time. And so uh, I want to know what is, like Esther, what does Esther mean? We know it means star, but her name wasn't Esther. It was given to her to protect her Jewishness from the Persians. And uh, somewhere it says that Mordecai changed the name when he submitted her into the into the, into the pod, into the competition, the beauty competition. And uh, uh, other people say that the king gave her the name. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Remember, it's God's word. Um, but uh, what I have on Esther is a little lengthy, but uh, I have time now. Uh, what is the date of the book's writing? Well, the book of Esther was likely written between, and this is 460 B.C., through 350 B.C. No one really knows for sure, and they don't know who wrote it. Uh, the books, the studies say it could have been Nehemiah, Ezra, or Mord Mordecai. Again, it doesn't really matter. It could have been another Jewish uh, uh, religious person out there, somebody who watched the whole thing. Uh, it certainly wasn't one of Xerxes' kids. So according to, again, according to post-biblical sources, nothing is known of its author. It could have been, and I said Ezra and so forth and so forth. The book's inclusion in the canon, as well as the observance of the Feast of Purim, which is what this is all about. Today the Jews celebrate Purim, and it's a two-day event. And we'll come, I'll come up here a little later and tell you why it's two days. Um, but it's the only holiday that it's not mosaic. That means that it was not decreed by, uh, by God through Moses. It was birthed here because of Esther. Um, uh, so, on the, so as well as the observance of the Feast of Purim, on the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar, or Adar, in March, that's in our March, in our Gregorian calendar, 
Uh, it still met with strong opposition on the part of the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem as late as the third century AD. We're talking about over 700 years later, the, um, the higher upper, the higher up uh, Jewish leaders didn't think that Esther was real or belonged there, and so it was being opposed. And of course, today, that writer that I referred to, um, to Mike a few weeks ago, this Bible scholar, said it was a joke and it should be, a, that it's theatrical and doesn't belong in there. Uh, despite its lack of specific religious content, the story has become, in popular Jewish standing today, a magnificent message. The message is this, the, pro the providence of God's will is to preserve his people from total destruction. Yes. Yes. Okay, it's today. Yes. Today. Um, one of the guys that I learned, that I was, that I, I was taught by, this gentleman by the name of Les Felder, was in um, Europe, uh, traveling through uh, uh, Jerusalem and, and Israel, and uh, one of the uh, one of the Jews who was not a not a born again Christian asked him, uh, "So, what do you attribute for the fact that the Jews are still here today?" And uh, Les told him, "You, your survival, the Jews being here today in Jerusalem." And, and, and having survived everything you've gone through from the exiles on through today, that is proof <laughs> that the Bible is true. And, that, and, and, and so, I mean, that is a, a, a great answer. I mean, today, uh, I'm, I am uh, so, I always feel so satisfied that someday the United States and other countries are, are all going to go against Israel. And they're going to survive us. Right. You know, they are under this providence. Yeah. And, um, and, and so this, that's, that's, what, that's what the book of Esther is about. We'll come to see that a little later. If you, have you read, uh, who has, oh, I shouldn't ask that, I was going to ask, who hasn't read this? Uh, Esther is a real popular book of the Bible. Almost yeah. everybody knows about Esther and, and uh, the, those two, uh, oh this, you know. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me, blah, blah, blah. And, he, and she says, and then my mage and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king against, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Uh, she had been told by Mordecai, if you don't go, somebody else is going to take your place and get this done. And you're going to die anyway. Your household, your, your whatever. So... Uh, yeah. This was her, her. She wanted to save her people. Right. Well, she didn't want to do that. She would just listen to Mordecai and his teachings. Yeah. She didn't know much. I mean, they were not. These people have been there for hundreds of years now. For, I mean, this is taking place 150, 175 years after the exile. I mean, and they started coming back to Jerusalem over 100 years before this. Many of the, not many, about 50,000 Jews had left at once to come back and rebuild the. Uh, the walls that I uh, mean at, in, in Jerusalem, but over a hundred, well, several hundred thousand, could have been a million Jews stayed behind. You know, they stayed behind because they were comfortable, they were in business, yes. they were safe. safe. Remember the uh, the Israelites in Egypt? Nobody attacked Egypt. Yeah, they, they were, were safe, and they didn't want to get out. They didn't, God didn't hear their call until they actually called for help, until things got really bad. The Jews remaining in Persia are the same. They're not going to leave until things get pretty bad. Yes. So what's to come here? They're going to see that they were almost annihilated. I said it right. I was saying <laughs> annihilated. <laughs> Remember, English, my second language. So she says, no, it's not. It's annihilated. <laughs> I don't forget everything. <laughs> so anyway, as I'm saying, the, the, the Jews, the, they loved it there. It was fertile. It was rich. They were in business. They had slaves. I mean, they had cattle. They were in business. They had friends that were Persians. And they had assimilated into the into, into into the country, you know, and they were not all over, a, a single one here and there, maybe a few families. 
they didn't want to leave because it was safe there. I mean, I'm sure some Jews, some um, Israelites escaped Egypt back when they were uh, there. Um, sure. There's no writing of it, but I, I'm sure a couple of guys said, let's get out of here. You know, let's go to Mount Sinai and, you know, tap the rock or something. I don't know. But it's not in the Bible, you know, so I, I, I don't go there with it. So, uh, as I said before, uh, why doesn't the book of Esther mention God? I'm going to try to get into that a little bit. The book of Esther is unique in several ways. One distinguishing character is that it's one of only two biblical books that do not mention God by name. This fact has caused some question. It's placed in the biblical canon. But in reality, the absence of God's name fits perfectly with the theme of the book. Okay, and that's why we study deeply to find out what is the theme of the book. No, let me get through this. We'll talk later. Here are some reasons why God's name may not have been referenced in Esther. First, one emphasis of Esther appears to be how God works behind the scenes. The book of Esther records no miracles, no direct intervention of God at all. In Esther's story, the Lord redeems his people through the faith and the courage of one strategically placed woman and her cousin. You get that? Strategically placed. No accident. All the while, things are happening behind the scenes to bring the final results. Also, it is possible God is not mentioned directly in Esther because of the circumstances of its writing. Jewish tradition claims authorship by Mordecai. If Mordecai is the author, he wrote the book in, he wrote the book in Persia while serving under the king. Instead of directly crediting God for the victory of the Jewish people, Mordecai may have written the book to better fit the poly, polytheistic context of Susa, the capital. So this would have kept him protected from harm by the king and other enemies while still communicating the account of God's work through Queen, the Queen Esther. Okay, the Jews living in Persia at this time were not following the law, the commandments, they had assimilated, uh, there was no holidays, nothing being, being celebrated. It was just as if they had never been from the family, from the line of Judah and Benjamin. That's who was there, the southern kingdom. And a few others that, that had, a few others from the northern tribe that had migrated to the southern kingdom while the Syria was taking over the northern kingdom. So it wasn't all Judah, Judah and all Benjamin. It's just it's not that easy. Another emphasis in Esther is the theme of fasting. Okay, there are six separate feasts throughout the book, and these stand in stark contrast to Esther's choice to fast for three days before confronting the king with the matter of saving the Jewish people. What this is saying is there were so many feasts, when did you have time to fast? Okay. She likewise asked other Jews to join her. And here it is. Go gather all the, all the people, all the Jews in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. This you can read in Esther 4.16. It is understood that fasting is done before God and to request God's help. How do we do that? Prayer, right? So even though God's name is not directly mentioned, Esther is involved in a religious observance meant to supplicate God's mercy. Finally, the book of Esther may not mention God because the emphasis is on God's providence. Here's that word again. Mordecai states in Esther 4.14, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, here's another one that I love, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Put this verse in your situation today. You know, uh, I know... <laughs> Mike knows my story a little bit, doesn't know everything, but this is not where I was going to be 
even a year ago. And this church is not where I was going to be 10 years ago. Bella Vista is not where I was going to be just the year before that. Okay. God put, and, and I didn't want to do this. And I thought, I'm just going to listen to somebody else other than my own little pea brain. And so Mike told me about this. And I, I don't know, I'm still sweating today from it. So it's not that, it's, that I love it or it's easy. But I, I've learned what it's done. It's, uh, I'm getting more out of this than any of you. Amen. Combined. <laughs> I, got, I have my paperwork here that it did not include. If you want to come and see it afterwards, you're, 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 um, you're welcome to do so. It's another 50 pages. Uh, it's an interesting book. You know what? They all are when we dig into the names and the history and the surroundings. Mike did that beautifully last week. Right? Who was here last week when Mike did? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was fantastic. He, that encouraged me to go back to these, to me, meaningless wars, but they were meaningful because it brought about this king, Xerxes, who was really, I mean, there's some stories about him, about his anger. He was actually nuts. He was nuts. You know, when he was defeated out there in the Aegean Sea or somewhere, and, and, his, and, and um, he had a bridge put across, you know, from Turkey to Europe, and uh, it, a storm brought it down. He was so angry that he killed, he had beheaded all the engineers and all the people who constructed it. Then he went out, he, he, he commanded his troops to go out on ships and stab the water with hot iron and to whip it. And then he went out himself and he cursed it and he screamed at it and he punched it at the water for tearing down this bridge that he had wanted. Uh, that is not a man I want to be leading my country. But, I don't know, we got something. Uh, so, uh, I don't know where I'm at. But how about if I start here? Finally, the book of Esther may not mention God because the emphasis is on God's providence. I said that. Oh, I, I finished at a position for a time such as this. I took that much time because I was speaking of myself, that I didn't plan it. You just, you, you are put there. You are put there like Esther was put there. That's what the Bible teaches me today. Anyway, when I get into it like this is that, you know, God's providence is just, it's not something you can control or I'll sway his providence a little bit this way or that way, the way I used to try to do my life in the past. Chuck, you got something. This seems to be another attempt to wipe out the Jews just like Hitler tried to wipe them out. You think? And God's name wasn't mentioned then either. Well, I'm sure some people were, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Hitler, when he was in his, um, yeah. in his basement down there in his uh, concrete bunker. still trying to wipe out the Jews. That's the, whole, the only reason we are here in the United States and alive and protected by our government, so to speak, is because God has protected the Jews. Amen. I don't know if I'll get to it. Uh, the, uh, the existence, let me see if I remember it. The existence, the existence of the Jews is necessary for the appearance of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Without, without the Jews today, if they had been uh, annihilated completely, uh, Jesus Christ wouldn't have had a reason to come because he right. came for the lost sheep. That's right. Okay? The lost sheep of Israel. He didn't come here for the Gentiles. Not then. But he had a plan. He knew eventually he was going to wind up in Bella Vista. Uh, so, uh, let me see if I can finish this up somewhere. The book of Esther may not directly mention God, yet it clearly reveals God at work. His name is not written in the book, but his fingerprints, that's what I've been talking about here, as we say, are all over the book. The coincidences, the amazing reversals, the poetic justice that led to the deliverance of the, Jewish, of the Jews in Persia all proclaim the presence of God. Okay, um, after the movie and after a little talk, I was going to um, give you uh, my summation of this thing. Oh. Sorry, 945. I did a good job in expanding. It's a very interesting book. Uh, so I have a summation here that 
I got this from a uh, from one of the uh, one of the many teachers out there, and there's many teachers out there. We can get a lot of teaching outside of these. We can't learn enough here from the pulpit or from here. It's just the Bible is just too big. Mm -hmm. It's just too big and too beautiful. You know, it's not hard. It's just so my submission is this. So what can we take away from this beautiful book? One of the lesson providers I studied gave me this conclusion. In Esther, we are given a behind-the-scenes look at the ongoing struggle of Satan against the purposes of God, yes. especially against his promise of a coming Messiah. The entrance, here it is, the entrance of Christ into the human race was predicated upon the existence of the Jewish race. No Jesus, no Christ. Just as Haman plotted against the Jews in order to destroy them, so has Satan, Satan set himself against Christ and God's people. Just as Haman is defeated on the gallows he built for Mordecai, so does Christ use the very weapon that his enemy devised to destroy him and his spiritual seed. For the cross by which Satan planned to destroy the Messiah, the cross was the very means to which Christ Having, con having canceled the written code of its regulations, the laws, that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers, the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphant, triumphing over them by the cross. It is by the cross, the work of the cross, that we are believing in that work of the cross. His his arisen, being arisen, and his uh, ascension to be with the Lord, believing that that died for our causes, erased our sins, buried, ro arose on the third day, spent a few more days with the, uh, let's say with us, and then he went home to be with the Lord. Amen. Okay, believing that, and then going on afterwards, once you're a believer in Christ, is to do good works for Christ. And that's what we're doing here today. Nobody came here to see what the show is all about. Okay, so that's, uh, again, I've got, I don't know, a lot of um, really good stuff here, but I can't put it all in. This is the bones that I could, yesterday after evening, I told Joyce I'm going to try to wrap it up a lot earlier. I went back to wrap it up, and I lost my file. I don't know how I did it. I don't know. I have so many files going and so many notes. I had to recreate it from 6.30, what, to 8.30? So whatever is here is what the Lord asked, you know, had me put back into my script today because God is good. All the time. All the time. I knew you would say that. Thank you. I think, uh, Joe, uh, Chuck, how are you doing for anything else? I, I apologize, but I have to get through this. You okay? Are we still friends? <laughs> well, we had a little tit for tat so a while back. Learn. Yeah. There's so much to learn. Yeah, we know the basics. That's right. Yeah. Got to have the basics. Yeah. Okay.